honor to be able to present something about Owebo and about this old farmhouse. I want to begin with a disclaimer. Jean and her enthusiasm made it sound as if I've been in a concerted way researching this and writing something up for years and years and that, in fact, this moved one person to say she was looking forward to hearing my talk about my book. I have no book. <laughs> I'm not even close to a book. What's well, coming? <laughs> Maybe you need to. So what, what has been the case, and the, the way that the years and years got into, I think, uh, what Jean wrote, is that I've been coming up here since 1984, and of course, immediately was, even before I came up here, before I married Tim, he had mentioned about this place and about some strange camp named Owevo. So I was hearing lots about it, but always very piecemeal, and in the early years we came up for very, very brief periods. My in-laws were here in residence in the summer times, and we just came up for short visits. So over the years I got a somewhat confused idea about what constituted Owevo, what constituted Mary Northland, and when this property was all part of it. And so it was really only in the 90s, I think it was 96 or so, when um, my mother-in-law, Alice Wise Carver, who was an Owevo camper, was slowly losing her ability to speak and uh, her voice was becoming hoarser and hoarser and it was hard for her to sometimes uh, come out with words. And I had been thinking, you know, I really should do some kind of an oral history before this becomes impossible. And I think that summer, on the last day she was here, I said, I've got to do this, and I grabbed a tape recorder and I recorded it, and by the next summer she couldn't have done it. And that was kind of what got me a little bit more focused on doing this, and in the late 90s, I did some other oral history interviews with people who either had attended uh, Owevo or worked there or knew about it. So that's how this really got started. And, and then I also photographed <coughs> the remaining camps once I became clear about the, the, what the boundaries of the camp were and after I had run on to drawings done by Reese North that were bird's eye view of the camp and, and were really quite detailed and accurate little pictures of the various cabins, all carefully marked and the, with the layout. So this is where I've been slowly going, but I certainly have not done a lot of formal research and I threw together a lot in the last few weeks um, and there's a mountain of really marvelous material. So that's the disclaimer. <coughs> I also want to say that I'm dedicating this presentation to my two most favorite enthusiastic Owebo campers. Uh, Alice Wise Carver, who died in 2003, and Virginia Sutton, who died just this year in May. I, I, at this point, will also just point out some people in case all of you didn't get a chance to meet each other. There are people here who are connected with the camp far more intimately than I am. Ed Phillips worked there and uh, when it was an adult camp. And uh, if you want to hear lots of really great stories, you must talk to Ed afterwards. Of course, uh, Ginny's husband and daughter are here, Martha and Lisa Sutton, my husband Tim Wise Carver. We've all over the years, you know, talked with them. And there are three members of the Hartwell family who are very closely tied um, with the North family. And Vicki is right here, Vicki Rogers, Patty, Mason is back there, and Chris Hartwell is sitting there. And uh, their mother, in fact, uh, was one of the people I did an oral history interview with. So I think at this point, having said those preliminary remarks, I'm just going to try to give you a brief sketch of some of the dates. I do not have all of these dates correct. I've done the best I can in a short amount of time. I would ask those of you who catch me in an egregious error to wait till the end of the presentation and then anybody who has questions can just ask them generally and anybody who really has a better sense of things that I've gotten mixed up can kind of chime in and, and give their two cents worth. So I'll make these remarks, then we'll have the slideshow, and then we'll break and open doors and breathe again. And if, if, if it gets too suffocating before that point, please just stop everything. We will open doors and let people stand up and stretch and do whatever they need to do, okay? To the best of what I can figure out now, there were two people who came here in the early 1900s with their families on fishing trips. And that was Herbert Hartwell and Frank North. They both worked at the Portland High School. Frank was the principal and Herbert taught, I believe, French. 
they were very good friends, and they, I, I believe, according to Connie, that Herbert actually first started coming to Pleasant and then kind of discovered Thompson, and Frank got very interested in it, and they jointly bought a chunk of shoreland from the owners of this farm. And this was uh, owned by a family called Fry. And it was a very rustic farm. They raised sheep. And you'll see one picture where there were still sheep at a late date grazing out in the field back here. They, uh, they established a kind of almost a little communal living situation because they built first, a, I think, a, a tent platform and later a small lodge where they could prepare meals and, and relax in the evenings but slept in tents for at least a long period of time before they established small buildings down there. So this was a quite a long stretch of shoreline property. It included originally Mary Northland, which is where we go down to swim, but which was later ceded back to the Fries so that Mary North could buy the Fry farm and in including some shore property for herself, as I understand it. So this was in the early 1900s. It might have been around 1905 or 6, somewhere in there. Now, Mary North was a Wellesley graduate. Uh, she never married. She was a dedicated teacher who taught in Montclair, New Jersey. She, although her first, um, her first studies had been in German, she majored in German, she minored in history, and that's what she taught and eventually became the chair, chairperson of the department there in, of social studies. She had obviously long harbored some idea about doing a girls' camp. And in preparation, because I think she was a person who really thought through things carefully, she decided to have like practice camps before she bought any land anywhere. And she, in 1908, had, um, she just, I guess, rented space at an inn in Reading, Connecticut, and went with a, just a handful of girls that she recruited I think from some family members, some from her students. And they did that for a couple of years as she kind of got a feeling for what she needed to do to run a girls' camp. By 1911, she had already decided <coughs> to, to build the camp and had bought the property. So somewhere in that period, she must have been told about it by Frank and had come to visit and decided this would be a lovely spot for a camp. So in 1911, she started building it with the help of her family. So my mother-in-law told a story that she was two at the time that summer. Her mother was up here cooking for the, for the family members who were working on the camp, and they were all sleeping in tents. Various cousins, I think, with small children came up uh, you know, with their parents to help out. Reese and I don't know who all else actually were building the first building, which was called the bungalow, and it was the recreation center and a, a general meeting place. It later also had arts and crafts on the underside. So that was, I think, the first one. I don't have a date for this construction of the beehive, and I can't remember if Kathy Scheller told us when we were there if she had a date for that, but it must have been around that same time because they would have to have some kind of dining hall. The camp started, I think, uh, with probably very rustic sleeping quarters, even more rustic than what it ended with. I think there were platforms with tents, and you'll see several pictures where the dormitories are just tents. And she slowly built it up. Um, she ran the camp, always adding to it, making it more elaborate, building better structures. She ran the camp from 1913 until 1931. I think that's a pretty solid date because a newspaper article written by a former camper, Della Bryce, who became a journalist, states that as the date. So I, I would imagine she'd try very hard to get that accurate. At that point, her brother Reese was out of work because of um, hard economic times, and she decided to turn it over to him and his wife, Catherine, also known as Catchy to run it as an adult recreation camp. I think it maybe was empty or almost empty for about a year. And then they started running it very informally at first with guests who kind of just cooperated with each other, and then more formally later with families who paid, I guess, a standard fee. And it's at that point that Ed will be very helpful because as a young boy, when he started coming up with Richard North, his good friend from school, 
he very quickly started um, working at the camp. And although at that point Mary North was no longer running the camp, she continued to live in the director's cabin, which was right near the diving dock and was right on the shore there and called Awanox. One thing that Mary had done, and the, the, the buildings of the camp have these Indian or pseudo-Indian names, who knows how accurate these are or even where she got them, but she, that must be a period where the, there was enormous interest in all things Native American because part of the ritual of the camp was to induct the girls into the Pemawakwa tribe and they were all to choose Indian names that were significant to them in some way or other and then they could earn these different degree levels in the tribe by mastering a lot of skills and the skills ranged from wildlife identification, flora and fauna identification to advanced skills in canoeing and swimming and diving and they also hiked enormous numbers of miles and they kept a complete record of that for every summer and it was all on a list. I'm going to show you what um, some of that looked like. One thing they did was after it got more organized and they had they did not have the Pemawakwa tribal thing immediately, but after they did it, they would they, we have several of these. I'm sorry they are in such terrible shape and I'm sorry that the light isn't very good. Um, but this is done on a shade. Yeah, turn that on I think it did help a little bit. Um, this is done on a shade, and it's very carefully lined up with all the different degrees, all the skills you are to attain, and if you've attained them, you've got a star in that little box. Several of Tim's relatives, Tim's and Lisa's relatives, are on here. Uh, I think uh, Betty and Alice, uh, Betty was the older sister of Alice and Virginia, they're on here. There was uh, one summer briefly where another cousin, still living at 102, Anna North Hoyt and her sister Jean, who is deceased, both attended for only two weeks. They, their names both appear on this, this thing. And so it's, it was really impressive, and all this record keeping was uh, something amazing as well. I'll show you one other artifact here which is that uh, after a while, I think the very sheep that were part of this farm gave their wool to make blankets for the camp with the Owebo symbol on it. So we have the O with the pine tree in the middle. And I do want to, um, before I continue any, well, I guess what I'll do is next is just tell you very briefly the kind of ending story of the camp, and then I want to read you a little bit from some of Mary North's brochures because it gives you a feeling for the tenor of the camp. Reese ran the camp, I think, for somewhere about, what, was it as long as 10 years? From about 1932 to maybe 1942, 43, somewhere in there, I think that Reese and Ketchy were running the camp. And at that point, they, they stopped, and I think Reese must have found work again in his field. And they sold the camp to Lou and Guy. Who came to the camp? Tucker. Tucker. Pardon me? I have no assignments. He also found work with who came to the camp. Lou and Guy Tucker then bought the property. Lou had been a camp counselor. And they ran the camp. I, I think in a somewhat helter-skelter way, but with great charm, judging by the wonderful pictures that were donated by her niece uh, just a few years ago to the Historical Society, and some of which you'll see because I copied them. Uh, I understand that they were always kind of short of money, and so there were at least two winters where they wintered over in those very rustic, uninsulated cabins and somehow got through the winter and made do. So I think that they ran it as an adult recreation camp up until somewhere around 1954. There was a man named Joe Wells who attempted to run it for two more years in 56 and 57 after he bought the property. And at that point, I believe, it was sold to Mr. Lawton, who then broke the property up. Mary, in 1923, 
had bought the rest of the farm, the Fry's decided to retire, they gave they, they sold to her the whole rest of the property. She said I think the property was in its totality about three hundred acres, but in her brochures she did not count obviously property that she decided to hold back, keep for herself, even after she knew that she'd give up the camp, because she lists the camp as being two hundred acres. The original camp along the shore was only three acres. So she started the process of of sprucing up this house, which was very, very rustic. And I'll show you pictures, uh, the oldest pictures we have, and then remark during the slideshow some of the changes she made to improve the house and make it more livable. But even after she had made her improvements, she talks in letters that she wrote back and that have come to light recently in, in the family about just the enormous difficulties there were in opening this place up once she was a woman in her late 60s coming up during wartime with her sister and brother-in-law, uh, Lucy and Edgar Rice, and taking care of little Timmy while his mother worked and his father was overseas. <laughs> so we have some charming anecdotes about how little Timmy behaved when he was up here. <laughs> so I think the next thing I'll do um, is just read a couple selections from her brochures to give you a feeling for what the camp was like, and then I'll start the slideshow up. Um, she says, Owevo is an Indian name applied by a Mexican tribe to a camping spot having all the advantages of a permanent camp. In fact, the translation of the word is the place to which they return. The choice of the name for Camp Owevo has proved to be fortunate, for the campers come season after season. One year, 87% of the girls returned. I will tell you something about how she managed that. Uh, I think even her brothers, probably, whom I understand didn't always give her the respect she should have had as an intellectual woman, admitted that she was quite a businesswoman, and certainly lit the next generation did as well, because I know Tim's father was, uh, by accounts from Marshall Sutton, was really impressed with how she could make a go of this on a teacher's salary all that life, all of her life, and always understanding that a female teacher never made more than two-thirds of what a male teacher could make. And so she really put everything she made back into it, but she made some very interesting decisions, which I think are rather daring. And one of them, which Anna told me about, is that she would recruit the girls from Boston and New York. In the middle of the winter, after she'd started the camp, she would have a reunion at a fancy hotel in New York City, and she would pay, I think, for a tea so that the campers with their parents and prospective campers could come to this lovely thing and reminisce about the, you know, the lake and what had happened the summer before, and then, you know, really inspire people to return or younger siblings to come or for them to tell neighbors or whatever else. And it apparently really paid off, even though that must have cost a pretty penny. Which we must have been talking about, say, 40 people at these reunions. So she did some, some interesting things, and she must have been quite a forceful person. Uh, let me just take out a couple other things for you. The camp is in a pine grove on the edge of a desolate meadow. Beyond is unbroken forest. Deer are not infrequently seen in the neighborhood, and the call of the loon startles those to whose ears it is an unfamiliar sound. The lake is ten miles long and has not been spoiled by cottages, <laughs> most of its shores being edged with a healthy second growth of pine, hemlock, birch, and beech. And then um, the requirements she talks about uh, for swimming were just amazing. Even for the first year, they had to prove themselves in doing all sorts of different strokes, treading water, uh, running jump from springboard, standing jump from four-foot tower. They worked up to diving from a six-foot tower, half-mile swim, mile swim, dive and swim underwater, and, and that was just the swimming requirements. And then I kind of got a kick out of what she said about the health of the girls. The health of the girls is a first consideration. Each girl is measured the day she reaches camp, the 1st of August, and the day she leaves. And the gain in some instances is almost unbelievable. <laughs> Practically the whole of the 24 hours is spent out of doors as meals are served in the open air dining hall and the girls sleep in open shacks. 
The briar bush, which you will see a picture of, with an outside sleeping porch is the shack devoted to the care of those who need medical attention. Here is the resident trained nurse who is responsible for the health of the camp. The following from the nurse's report in the 1921 Owebo breezes is of interest. Briar bush gained at different times only seven occupants throughout the entire summer. Half of the number had nothing more serious than colds. For the remainder, gastric disturbance was mainly responsible. In size and weight, Owebo progressed as followed. And then instead of like, giving an average or something, the overall gain for the camp that year was one foot four and a half inches. <laughs> <laughs> the chest measurements were five feet three inches. <laughs> <laughs> and she goes on to talk about the Pemwakwa tribe and the eligibility. They had a special dance that they did and all sorts of ceremonies and inductions for the girls. And I thought the conclusion kind of set the tone as well. It is the purpose of a Weibo to make its campers happy all the day, but it, this cannot be done by merely providing amusement. Obedience, law, and order are quite as necessary as pleasure. Consideration for others is a first principle at a Weibo, and the selfish girl soon finds herself quite alone. Thus, with health as a foundation, occupation as a stimulus, and upright living as a principle, the girls at a Weibo find life in the great outdoors a real priv privilege. Who wrote that? That was Mary. Yeah. This is in her. This is in her book, and I think I'll maybe just read one more thing because it's uh, very warm and cramped. And I know you want to see the pictures. This, um, these Awebo breezes, which started up after the camp had been in existence, I think were based on four-page leaflets that the girls produced every week and mailed home to their families. But I, so I am assuming that the nice little bound books that came out of that which look like this, and have quite a few pages with articles written, some by Mary North, but most by counselors and by the girls themselves, some of them kind of amusing and telling about things they did, that those must have been bound copies that were put together out of all of these offerings. So um, that what led up to that, I think, in the early years, are what is contained in some of these books, which we still have, at least partly. This one happens to come from 1914, only the, the next year after she began. And what she would do is assign a girl uh, to write about the day's activities every single day. And then sometimes she would take a day as well. And they would go through the whole summer session with someone recording the activities, but from their point of view. And so the girls differed in age and perceptions and tone of writing and everything. And although there are many of things that the girls wrote that are charming, and there is one book at the end, which I'm not going to pass around everything because some things are fragile, but I do have an album that I'll pass around. And you can see behind plastic a, a couple samples of writings by the girls. We're going to read you one by Mary North because I, I think it gives a feeling for um, her kind of uh, romantic attitude toward the outer doors and also her absolute uh, dedication to this project. This was written on July 26, 1914. Today has been a beautiful day, for all outdoors has been bright and laughing. No threatening clouds has troubled the sky, and the faces of the girls have caught the spirit of the day. In the service in the Hemlock Grove, and I'll tell you about that in a minute, we finish the story of the Old Testament, and besides this, the girls recited the scripture text that they had chosen. Some of them have great success in finding comforting verses. Toward evening, the lake became so boisterous that we feared it would drown our singing, as we had vespers on the ledge up the hill. There was a lovely view of the sunset <clears throat> and the gem-like lake with its emerald setting, which gave to our service a special charm. After we had sung our favorite hymns, we started the hazardous descent of the hill with spotlights and lanterns for guides. And there, like restless fireflies, we flashed and flickered our way through the woods to our resting place under the boughs. <laughs> uh, she mentions the pine grove and the vespers. The girls didn't go to church. They came in by boat at first. There wasn't even a passable road, or any road at all, and then one that was barely passable. They held every day a little service in the morning. It was part of their daily routine. And then on Sundays, she preached. And they had a little grove that was above the beehive. It's listed on one of the maps that Reese 
drew, and there they would go for their services. I will do one last thing before I sit down and start the slides because I want to give you a feeling for what the day is like that they have. It's listed in one or both of these little books. Daily schedule, 7.15, setting up drill and morning dip in the lake. 8 o'clock, prayers in grove and a flag salute. 8.15, breakfast. 9 to 9.30, shack duties. Shacks were the dorms that they lived in, all these little rustic thing, places and sometimes tents on, on platforms. 9.30 to 11, arts and crafts, tennis and sports. 11 to 12.30, swimming and canoeing. 1 o'clock, dinner. 2.15 to 3.15, rest hour. 3.30 to 6, sports, hikes, arts and crafts. 6 o'clock, supper. 8 to 8.30, retiring for juniors. 9 o'clock, retiring for seniors. Juniors were 12 and under. Um, this is a picture of Mary North sometime in middle age. Formal portrait studio and her obituary that gave some of the information that I told you about. Now, in 1908, this was the inn that they apparently rented space in for just a handful of girls. And I wanted to include Reading Ridge because I think that it, it really gives a, a picture of the social changes. Does some... Cell phone. Cell phone. Cell phone. Not mine this time. <laughs> it, it really gives a picture of the social changes that happened for women because uh, what you'll see in the picture she took of the girls here is that there's still the, the flowing clothes and trying to do, it's kind of playing at being in the country and look at them all in their gorgeous dresses on top of the hay being pulled by the oxen. And, oh, I love the ribbons. Mary is right behind the, the horns of the um, oxen in front of us. On the horns of a dilemma. Yes. <laughs> This is actually tilted a little bit. It's just called resting in the barn. At least one of the young ladies in that group, or maybe two, are relatives of Tim's and Lisa's. Here they are in their hike. Their beautiful gingham dresses. And swimming. I don't know what body of water this is, but I assume something quite near ready. No bikinis. No, I don't think so. <laughs> the young woman in front appears to have a camera. And I like the boots that are showing in the one girl. Mm -hmm. Now this is when Oweeba was being constructed. Uh, the young boy chasing after a cat is another relative, Ernest North. And I, as I said, several family members came and kind of pitched in and they just lived in tents. So this is taken 1911. This, this is the beginning structure of the bungalow, which was that central meeting place, recreation bungalow. They would also have a lot of performance that, performances there. Here it is a little farther along. The chimney mason. And the interior with a note underneath that just went out of our view that says, it draws. <laughs> this is a much later picture of it, but you can also see how amazingly open it is for those of you who are familiar with what the terrain is like down the hill here. Is inside on a rainy day, and I'm pretty sure these are, that picture was taken inside the bungalow because it had a set of three windows on each side like that. This, I'm not sure about this. I, it was not an undated photograph. It, it is, I am assuming, a very early um, version of the beehive where it was extremely open. 
So that must be what they kind of tacked together first so that they would have a dining hall and then later modified and they closed the lower part. It's now, it's open once again, but the top part isn't open in that same way. I think this comes from a card that was made up when the camp uh, was probably an adult camp. There you see it's the, the beehive is closed on the underside and that, that area on the underside served at, at various times as boathouse um, storage for wood, for wood burning stoves, and also ice house. And if I've gotten that wrong, you can correct me. early camp cook. Now Kathy Schaller has said that the stove she's cooking on is the one they actually have in their camp, which is right there, but structurally it doesn't look the same to me. I'm wondering if she has another early I, stove. I think the, the original stove would probably have been wood fired. And That's the, what I'm thinking too. The one too. that they've got is propane. Yeah. So here's a, one of the tents on a tent platform and there's another one. This was a quite, quite high up off the ground. And they even uh, had a picture in one of the albums that she put together, which they just said a tent, a piazza for the tent. <laughs> so apparently several of the tent platforms had this little porch on the front. Now, when, the, when they did get around to building structures, you see they're just pine planks, but later Reese North had the idea to make them look more charming and rustic by tacking on the, the sheared off par bark from manufacturing, local manufacturing. And he either paid little or nothing for that. It's purely decorative. That lady on the right is a Hanna, Hannah Berg was her name. And apparently she and Mary North were, were for the first four or five years of the camp co-directors. I don't know how she met her or what their friendship was. Then after that, Mary's brochures say that she is the, the sole director. This is of interest because um, let me go back for a second. Because this was from the first year it opened, and things were very simple and rustic. And this was what they were using for their diving rock. And there's some kind of plank that's just going, presumably, from another rock over, and then people dive off of it. You know, by the time it was an established, a fully established camp, they had diving platforms that were quite large. That was part of what the girls had to master were those dives off a higher board. Yes. A couple different boats are referred to. This um, one was that's often referred to as the Borealis, which is this one. But there was another boat that comes up in her notes, which is the um, called the Lady of the Lake. They were looking toward the Cape, and again, you can see how open the ground is, how simple and kind of primitive this dock is, and the causeway to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is the entire camp the first year. Two of those girls are, is that Lila and Dorothy in there, North? The lineup. <laughs> <laughs> this was, I think, the second year, 1914. <laughs> I love the bathing caps. I think wonderful. <laughs> they had basketball. They had quite a number of different sports. Archery. You'll see pictures of several of these. That was their basketball team. This set of all dressed up for parishes. Does anybody know what parishes was or is? Because it must have been some place that they could go to for treats or something and they got all dressed up. Here's an obstacle course. I'm going to just go back for one second because you'll see something later. You see that roller? Mm -hmm. That was for the tennis courts and that's still down there. Mm -hmm. 
So I think this was about 1916 that the group had expanded this much. Mary North is on the left. And this is 1921. And Alice is this, I don't know if I can point her out. She's Alice Wise Carver is this little one right here. And what's not showing right now is to the side is Betty, her older sister, who looks, however, much smaller. This was an earlier, earlier of two drawings I have done by Reese, and this one was dated 1936. And one building that appears later is not in there. They were awakened with a bugle call in the morning, and there's the lady doing it. Oh, Here are the setting up exercises. Looks like Tai Chi. I know. A lot of good stretches going on there. I like the stockings worn in the... This is the morning dip. Looks like it's maybe off that rickety dock. And the prayer grove. And you see Mary North back there speaking to them. They would often do pageants that illustrated scenes from the Old Testament, say, and I'm imagining that this is one of them. But then in addition, the shacks, each shack would take turns putting on performances for the rest of the girls, and I think those were usually staged at the bungalow. Here's Arts and Crafts. Ginny Sutton is second from the right. Alice is again in this picture. She's the little girl standing to the left. Miniwawa. Miniwawa. And that is, I think, Dorothy <laughs> North doing archery. That's Lila North doing a back dive. She became a junior junior counselor for years. Well, you can you can tell this is much later, both because of the diving platform and the, and the skimpy outfits they're wearing. Here's I'm imagining what's going on here. You see, there are guests in this picture, and there's also a lifeguard on duty. And one of the exercises they did, and this was very important, it had to do with being, you know, you're, you're progressing through the different levels of use of the canoe, was that one of the tests you had to do was to go out in the canoe dressed, although the girls had their swimsuits underneath, have someone tip the canoe over, and you had to right the canoe by yourself in deep water, take your outer clothing off, put it in the canoe, and swim back to shore with the canoe upright. And I think they would actually have demonstrations of this and actually have the trials where everybody was watching. And I suspect, although this was not marked that way, that that might be what's going on here. Let me go back, that was too fast. So here the girls are doing their exercises in the canoe. I don't think I have in this group the war canoe which held Ten girls on one of their hikes. Look how much more business-like they look now <laughs> after the, the women we saw from Reading, Connecticut. Lila North is in the center back, and Betty no, Betty Rice is on the lower right, and Alice is second from the left. In this shot. It's Lila on the right. And also the other thing is in the early days, they were they all had long hair. And when they came to camp, they wore it in long braids. You can see some of the girls have it here as part of the tribal thing they did. But by some of those later pictures, like the one we just saw, the girls were all wearing stylish bobs. <laughs> They're making the word a weevo. And there's a little period at the very end over to the right, and that's Betty. <laughs> this is... Um, this is kind of impressive, I think, because they went on these sleep, overnight sleep out camping trips, 
and you could just see they just put bed rolls down on top of pine boughs and they were just sleeping out under the stars. So here's an early morning picture of someone waking up there. And here they've all gathered up their things and they're ready to hike back. And that's no fancy equipment, a bed roll that they had slung over their shoulders. Picnic on the Heath. Jenny Sutton is seated cross legged second from the right. I think she must have been a junior camper there, and that was the quad drangle, earlier known as the June bug. Here's one of the, the here's one of the performances <laughs> done by one of the shacks. I have no idea what that all is about. Lila is again in this picture as one of the junior counselors. So I think these must all be the counseling staff. She had, uh, she hired people in specialties and they had to come with certification that they, they had passed some kind of required courses in say canoeing or swimming. There's Betty again in the middle of that group, Betty Rice. Any idea when Girl Scouts of America started? I do not. And this was taken just a few years ago. Well, in the 90s, uh, 99, I decided I better start taking pictures of some of the camp buildings before they disappeared. And actually, since then, I was amazed when I started doing it. And I was using, I did it in the fall when people weren't around, but I just wanted to record the buildings that were still standing. So uh, this is a Wannix, Mary North's uh, hut at, as director, and where she stayed even after she had stopped directing the camp. This is the interior. And many of the artifacts in this picture and a companion picture, which shows a little bit more of the room to the left, show things which are in this house. Uh, at least one person is sitting, I think Chris, you're sitting on one of those chairs. Mm -hmm. And we have the, some of the fire irons. That log carrier over to the right is right in this room. And there are several other things on a shelf over to the left that are still in the house. And some of those rugs are up in the attic. Now, I want to, at this point, just give you a little history um, about her acquisition of the house. This is one of the oldest shots we have of the Fry Farm. And at that time, the second build, the second house was standing on the right. So the house you're in now, I can't reach this, um, that is where we are right now. But even when Tim was growing up, there was a very simple little house up there. And I think those two go back to the Cobb brothers who established this farm together and built their houses right next door to each other. And there were several outbuildings. Now that, I never saw anything but the cellar hole and the caved in roof of that house on the right. And it has now been bulldozed over by another owner of the property before we were able to buy it back. But it, the house was extremely simple. It didn't have any dormers as it has now. This was um, the earliest picture from this view, and we got we were able to copy this from um, uh, not Howard Widom, but his sister um, Edith Edith Puglia. Edith Puglia owned this picture, but Howard showed it to us and allowed us to copy it. So you see that off of the L, um, there was a substantial uh, barn of some sort, and it looks like you can see something else between the space of that barn and the um, side of the house. She ra it was on the ground here. It looks like there's a bulkhead, so I imagine there was a crawl space under part of it, but Mary raised it up considerably so that there is a crude but um, basement that you can stand up in now underneath the main part of the house, but not under the L. She added dormers. Her brother Reese designed the lake porch that you were having your lunch on. So here is a picture of it after she had done a lot of, of the work on it. My mother-in-law said that the walls in the bedroom, and afterwards if you would like to look into the one bedroom that's behind us here, you can, you can see what, what my mother-in-law did to kind of redecorate it. She said, though, that originally it was covered with newspapers to keep it warm. This is a later picture of Jenny Sutton right out here in, um, on the lake side of the house, and you can see that there's a fence behind her and that there are still sheep grazing in that field. Who was before 
who was the couple before her? Oh, I want I should go back to that because I meant to say something about it. This is Lucy and Edgar, Tim's grandparents, but the reason I included this picture, they're out of focus, is it's the only picture I have that shows the edge of that second house. That was the Browns house. That was what was the Browns house, which I, I never saw standing. In the bathroom and on that little table next to you, Kelly, is a picture of Edgar Rice pumping water from the spring that was right next to the house out here, because they're standing right around just the corner of the house, and that's Cobbs Hill Road behind them. I think that's looking right down from the yeah. por porch area. Yeah, it was a, <laughs> it was a terrible pun. So there, there's the, the grandfather. This was a later picture of little Timmy with Allison <laughs> Barnes, uh, the grandparents, and Mary North. So this would have been right around that period I told you about when they took care of him up here when uh, the parents were both of them away. That was a later drawing. Now, at this point is where it switched over to pictures that I took from the collection donated by the niece of Lou Tucker. And I, I am imagining that Lou did this charming sign because I know um, from all the stories told she was very artistic. So that's what it looked like at that time. If the, if the picture goes over far enough to the right, you'll see the edge of the sign, or maybe we won't. What is this building, Sharon? This is the bungalow again, uh, uh, after more transformations and the camp vehicle. The original road down to Owebo went right at the edge of this field out here, a completely inappropriate road in that it, it, it wasn't uh, drained properly and it was incredibly steep and it eventually, this I just included to show how much upkeep there was. Here, here trees have fallen on top Is of the buildings. Is that the 38 hurricane? Probably 38, probably, yeah. 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 38 And how what challenges there were in running that camp and keeping even those Lou rustic Tucker buildings going. That's Lou and Guy Tucker. And the dogs. And the dogs. Mm -hmm. Three of the waiters for the adult camp. Do you know any of those people, Ed? Mm -hmm. Dad worked down here. That's not Dad in the middle, is it? Ellis? Do you want me to go back? It might be. Do you want me to go back? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it is. That would is that be your... when Lou and Guy... The one in the middle camp? Yeah. I yeah. think it is. Yes, but yes. that was when Lou and Guy uh, owned it. That's true. Uh... Well, that is... Had his I... attitude then, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> you're right. You're right. Oh, that's good. I'm a handsome man. Mm -hmm. He was. Middle, Middlebury was the college I was trying to think of. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. uh, this one I included because one of the destination hikes, both for the girls' camp and for the adult camp, went right up from the camp up to these exposed ledges. And those ledges are still there, but you can barely see the lake. That's completely grown in. And here it's very open, and it was a, a favorite spot for picnicking. And blueberries. Blueberries, yeah. That even when I first started coming up there, Blue so here's the adult camp. Owanix on the left. Yeah, that's where the weevil was on the north zone that put Bud North in the right in front right. of the picture. I, I saw, I saw yeah. Bud in the picture. Frank North is on the left, and Alan, Alan Hurst and Guy Alan Scribner Hurst. lived right beside our house, mm -hmm. the bird house yeah. there. In this guy, yeah. And bringing in the. I've seen a picture of Frank. Are these from the, from the album? The That's that from the album yeah. that was donated by the niece of Lou Tucker. No date on that. Uh, I would have to go back and check no, that. that. This is one of the few pictures we have of the camp buildings covered with snow and taken from the lake. Presumably up there trying to remove snow from the roof. I'm not sure if that's what he's doing. That's yeah. a good idea. I'm going to shovel off the roof. 
And this was of interest because there were several shots of the whole process of cutting ice to be stored for use in the summer times. These would be 1940s. Yeah. Right on that. I don't know if these particular ones were dated. That's on the That's yeah. Alma Hirsch, right about there. 40s, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That Alma Hurst? Yeah. 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 Love the oxen. Yeah. yeah. That's Martin Wiley, I think. Is it? Yeah, because he had his oxen down there. We used that picture on the front of one of the TLEA observers yeah. one year. It's a mm -hmm. wonderful picture. It is. It is. Is that that's Lou on the and the guy right yeah. with mm -hmm. the oxen? This one, unfortunately, was rather scraped up. This was that when I told you you'd see Briarbush, this was the infirmary. And there's the nurse. Mm -hmm. Briarbush is one of the buildings that is barely still standing. It's, um, it's, has, it's been ma mainly deserted. So that was a picture I took in 1999. I have not checked on its conditions since. This one I think is Minnewawa that you saw in some of the pictures, and this mm -hmm. one was in worse shape. But there were only about two structures that were missing when I went around. And at the time that I, in 99, the, the beehive was deteriorated badly, and several years later, the cooks um, made the big decision to renovate it, and they worked very hard at it. And I'll, I'll show you a few pictures of the renovation and the interior, and you see the stone fireplace is still there. This is the beautiful back porch. The side we're looking at now had a little library in it. That was nature the studies. But didn't it later, though, have books in it for a library? It was the only telephone on the shore. Was it, it was really? The we have many of Mary North's books as well, her nature study books. And she actually meant, now this was after they had started the renovation, and that little projecting part, um, they decided to just do away with, to simplify the renovation. They. Here was the interior. You see that same stone fireplace that we saw in those old mm -hmm. pictures when it was first built. Yeah. Grandpa and Uncle Reese built that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This was the beautiful out exterior renovation, almost completed, and then followed by a complete collapse after, from snow. Monstrous snows that oh. winter crushed it after they had been renovating it. This is a very current picture of the beehive. Just you see now still bare underneath now, they've taken away all that lower structure. And I'm going to have my niece and nephew come up and sing a little verse of something for you. And if any of you know it, let me go back for a second here. We'll go to um, Dash on Catherine, you want to do this? Are you up for it? Mm -hmm. Okay. This was, I just want to tell you a little story about this that the girls had several, several songs that they sang that they would write these to the very popular melodies of the day. And this was obviously a tune that, it was a tune from 1919, I think, Dreaming Alone in the Twilight. So they would use a tune or a part of a tune, and then they would write songs for the camp. And this was one of the ones that um, Alice and Ginny sang the most often and that you know we were getting kind of accustomed to and in the last months of her life Ginny would very spontaneously even though she was in very very poor health and very weak she would break into this song and it was just very touching to us and I think that mm -hmm. my niece and nephew were going to give it a go you want to do this Dash mm -hmm. Catherine are you are you up for it mm -hmm. tell you what I'll help you get started okay so why don't you kind of stand to the side a little bit so you're not blocking the letters and then other people can see the letters. You want to stand together? Why don't you stand together? 
Do you want it? You're all right that way? No, no, just stand to one side. Get together so I can both the friends. Okay, let's, okay. You ready? Okay. Right. Under the pines of the weevil, campers both old and new, bound by a loyal comradeship, all held the spirit, will I ever cheer it, this is the camp which we hold so dear, the finest will ever know. So there you have it, and thank you very much, and if you have questions, I'll do my best, but there are other people here who can answer some of them much better than I can. Where did, uh, principally, where did some of the girls come from? I think that um, Sharon, uh, the the term of Pemaqua, of Pemaqua, Pemaqua, whatever. Pemaqua <laughs> was the name of Thompson Lake before it became Thompson Lake. Oh, it supposedly you know where the, was the, name the, the of derivation of that word is. It supposedly was the name of an existing Indian tribe. And whether a, that's a local tribe from this area, because so, that was the first building at the Cape was called Pemaqua Lodge. Oh, the, then, but was the at the lodge? I mean, was Pemaqua Lodge uh, built at a time when the lake was still called that as it well? It was uh, 1897. Yeah, because Thompson Lake, the name came somewhat later. I think. But I know nothing about the supposed Indian tribe or how yeah. after it. I know there was something in the. You mentioned the word from that uh, breezes that you read from, from the brochure you read mm -hmm. from. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uncle Reese used to have a, uh, a map, and it, it had, uh, I mean, that he, he had made himself, and it said, uh, you know, in the lake, it said the lake and the water. Oh. Which I would have been so before. do you know why it would change to Thompson and who no, Thompson somebody, was? Somebody, there's a story that, that it was changed to Thompson because when they dammed the lake, somebody named Thompson drowned in it. But I don't know if that's, <laughs> that's, that's I don't know if that's true or not. And actually, it was Thompson Pond. When I first came here, it was called Thompson Pond. Oh, Frank Bean always referred to it as Thompson lake Pond. And, <laughs> it wasn't called Lake until it was probably around the 50s or something right. like that. Until they found out it was bigger than Pleasant Lake. Well, <laughs> whatever the answer is, but, but that was... Uh, when I first came here, I went to Thompson Pond. Yeah. yeah. That slide to the Puglerville Road, mm -hmm. that's East Otisfield. Mm -hmm. My mother yeah. lied to us and told us it was a mile from camp to East Otisfield, so we would walk there every Saturday with our allowance. All the kids from the shore would walk down there. And it turns out that's two and a half miles, and I never noticed until I was 45. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that picture you showed the girls hiking and camping out, and it said Puglerville. Well, the walking was Puglerville. Yeah, I don't but, know where they were But I think, I think they probably took the boat, the either a canoe yeah. or a boat, from here down there, because Camp Oevo owned a piece of land in Otisfield Cove, right on the coast, right. where the story I was told when it was a girls' camp, They'd order their groceries and things like that would come in from Portland by um, Hannaford Brothers that were the big wholesalers in those days, and they would leave the stuff into a, a house, or I mean a, a shed that was built on their piece of land. And then, then they'd go down by boat to pick up the groceries to feed the camp. I mean, that's the story that was always told to me by, mm -hmm. by, uh, by, that's what Dad by Mary, actually. Yeah, that's what told me those stories. Yeah, that was the that's still road. there too. Yeah. Yes. What building is that? Yeah, uh, it's a little green camp that sits uh, right on the north side of the the public yeah. landing. Uh, but it used—I remember it more. Dad mm -hmm. called it the uh, Aunt Mary North Shed. That's right. That's and it, um, he yeah. talked about the groceries coming there, yeah. and then I think sometimes he was one yeah. of the errand boys that. And they, they, uh, they, I think they owned that. Well, in the '30s when I was 
Is it? Here before the 40s. It was sold sometime in that vicinity. But what road was it on? Cove Road. Cove Road. Island Lane, whatever. No, Cove no, no, Road. 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 Actually, it's right, right near your, the, 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 the Pottle Camp Road, uh, Pottle Camp. Our lot. We have a little lot. boat landing lot yeah, there well, too, but it's that it's right down at the end, right beside that, the landing. Yeah. yeah. By the way, I used to leave my boat in the winter time upside down on the Pottle <laughs> back in. The, Still can if you the, want to. <laughs> <laughs> Is the Crescent Camp girls and boys? No, it's, it's in privately owned. Privately owned. Yeah. It's not a camp at all. Anymore. It's not a camp. No, oh. no, no it's, it was sold, when did I say the date was? In the 50s? In the 50s. 60s. 60s. Oh. 60s. And then broken up. What's unusual about it is that um, when Mr. Lawton sold it, he sold it in many cases to people he knew. And they really kept the rustic camps. I mean, they in the ones that they mostly occupied, they added electricity little by little, and you know some plumbing and what have you. But they they have kept the camps, the camp buildings, amazingly close to what they were. I could identify just about everything. There were some one case where a larger building had been cut in two and separated slightly, and another one where two had been joined. Just a couple, as I said, were missing, but almost everything was identifiable. And uh, I thought that was really quite extraordinary. But you know, a few of them that are not in real use are deteriorating, and it was a big loss when the the snow crushed the bungalow, mm -hmm. since that was the, the central building of the camp. That was uh, it was. Uh, Who's the Lawton buy it from? Uh, he bought it from Joe, Wells. Joe Wells. Joe Wells for two years attempted to run it in '56 and '7, I think it was, and then stopped doing that. He bought it from. He must have bought it from the Lewin guy, oh. Tucker. Yeah. Oh, that's right, from Lewin. Okay. What, uh, I, I don't know whether I should say this or not, but what happened with the with the bungalow was that, you know how it's a lot, it was a large open space downstairs? There were no supporting columns, you know, to the, to the ceiling. Um, and what the, what the camp had was up above the attic floor, there were some tie rods that went across the, the attic floor. And they, I don't know who, whose decision it was, but they didn't like having to go up into the attic and having to walk over, step over the tie rods. So they took the tie rods out. And that's why it collapsed. But plus the weight of the... Uh, it was an unusually severe winter and yeah. just massive amounts of snow. The weight of the snow was a bad winter. Is that it? Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Really wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're a great audience under stressful circumstances. Thanks for your